Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Bold Badass Business Owners. And boy, we bring you the boldest and we bring you the baddest. And hopefully we don't bring you the asses. <laughs> But we bring you the boldest and the badasses of business. And today I'm really thrilled that we have Meryl Lochner, who is the chief storyteller and does all sorts of podcasting for corporations. I mean, one episode of a podcast that she produced brought in 4.5 million dollars. Yes, let me say that again. Million, $4.5 million from one episode of a podcast that Meryl uh, produced. And so I'm just thrilled to have you here. Welcome, Meryl. Thank you. And actually, it just went up a little bit. The, my client actually sent me an email from someone saying, oh, I watched that podcast and I want to talk to you about it. And that was four and a half years ago. And Girl. it's still generating income. It's still generating responses. So you all, I want you to hear what she just said. Now, here's the thing. When you do a podcast or you're on a show like bold, badass business owners, guess what? Uh, for better or for worse, it stays on the internet unless somebody figures out a way to take it down or takes it down off individual sites. It's going to stay there. And you can have incredible traction created by that, right, Meryl? Oh, absolutely. You got good evergreen content. It is out there. And even if you take it down, if it got picked up by the Wayback Machine, it's on the Internet Archive and someone's going to still find it. So, I love that. I love that. OK, explain what you mean by by that, where they're the, going to find it, how they're going to find it. There is an Internet site called internetarchive.org. And they have a bot called the Wayback Machine. For those of us of a certain age, we know where that title comes from. And what it does is makes a copy of the internet, which is actually really, really useful. One of my clients I was talking to, so I went to his website and got a 404 error. And I said, um, Dennis, where's your website? I don't know what you mean, where's my website? Your website's missing. Well, it turns out his website was designed by someone's next door neighbor's nephew or whatnot. And the kid just stopped paying for service and whatnot, and his website was just gone. So I reached out to one of my web guys. We found a copy of his old website on the Wayback Machine. And within an hour, he was able to rebuild it. And my guy had his a new website up and operational in under an hour. Good Lordy, lands a living. Now that is hell right there. That is business hell is when your website, your website disappears or is hacked. Yeah. Or, you know, you forget God, God, I hope this never happens to y'all. One time I forgot to pay my, or my card had expired for my yeah. hosting. And uh, suddenly I got this message, you know, from, from a client, oh, your website's not working. <laughs> and luckily I was able to get it resolved really quickly. And she saw it super fast. So tell us again, the website they go to just out of, I want to add this to the comments. Oh, it's internetarchive.org. All right. I don't know. This is not letting me do comments for some reason, <laughs> but Internet Archive dot org. org, you all. And it's the Wayback Machine. The Wayback Machine. So yeah. any old websites that you ever did or remembered or, yeah, it's it may be hosted there. And if it's something that you actually want to save, you can actually go into the Wayback Machine and say, copy this, save this. So you'll, you'll always know that there's at least a couple of old copies of things that you have out there. That's fabulous because, you know, there's nothing worse than having your backup or your backup of your backup destroyed. You know, I remember a computer guy recently saying to everyone at a networking group, make sure that you have a backup that's not in your house. Mm -hmm. That is and, you know, of course, have a cloud backup, but have an external one and keep it somewhere else. Yep. I've got you know. two externals. I've got three online. I've got Dropbox. I've got Backblaze. I've got Carbonite. Short of a meteor strike, I am covered. <laughs> Girl, I think you could you could get through, uh, you know, the apocalypse. Actually, you, you could you could survive the apocalypse and an alien invasion. And, you, you know, run a business, you work at home, losing your stuff is the apocalypse. So you, you mitigate as best as you can. 
It absolutely is. And I, I, I could tell you, but I had a few years ago, I had a scare with that and I did lose some stuff. Mm -hmm. And I decided being my me, I decided that it was probably a good thing and that I just needed to recreate it um, and went on with that or needed to let that that content go. But, you know, for a while it was it was very upsetting. And thankfully, photos and all of this sort of stuff I was able to find. Mm -hmm. So Meryl, you know, our topic today is so good. I love when, when you suggested, you know, that a lot of people are boring because I think it, Meryl, I think it at every networking event I go to and I don't say it, I sit there and I smile, but I'm thinking, oh my God, could we please, could we please have some energy? Could we please have some pizzazz in our language? Could we please have some excitement? And uh, a lot of people don't have it. So what makes people so boring? What would you say are the things that make people so boring in their business communications? Primarily fear. They're mm. afraid of coloring outside the lines. It's like, okay, these are the facts. We're just going to give you some facts and figures and numbers. Isn't this exciting? I think you'll find this. Please, I have a friend who's always looking at interesting investments, and he sent me over this video of, this looks like a really cool investment opportunity. What do you think? And I'm looking at it, and it's this nine-minute video of a PowerPoint. And it's like, here's some charts. It's like, look at all the money you could make. This is a really exciting way to spend. It's just like... Can, can, can you make this any more boring? <laughs> I have to tell you, I watched a video. It was a video of a ad before a YouTube video earlier today. And literally there was a voiceover narrative, Meryl, and the guy was freaking lip syncing. Oh, and he's dear. like ancient. He's got the guy who created this program is like ancient. And he's lip syncing with this much younger, sexy kind of voice. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, what the hell is he thinking? Mm -hmm. We all know that's a bunch of bullshit. We know he's lip syncing. It's worse than air guitar. Stop. Oh, yeah. And I love the, the AI things where they're like, okay, hello, I am a real human being. No, really. Notice I'm not blinking. And then they like, okay, like program in the blinking. Hello, today I'm going to be talking about, and they had someone like, okay, well, we need to do something with hands. It's like, hello, today we are going to be talking about how to do this. And like, are you making meatballs? What are you doing? <laughs> That's and hilarious. especially if you're trying yeah. to brand yourself as something authentic, Yes. Don't, don't use the AI bots. I mean, the one place I saw an AI bot work well was on a tech group site talking about all oh, AI and how to automate a lot of stuff, then yes, having an AI bot as part of your brand, that's perfect. If, but if you're doing like, yes, we, we care about humans and, and we believe in authentic relationships, don't use a bot. Exactly. Don't use AI voices because I guess as a podcast producer, I can hear the bots because for one thing, they enunciate every single word. Well, yes. regular humans slur. It's that, it's like once yeah. upon a time or once upon a time. Right. That's how humans speak. We tend to slur as opposed to the AI voices that enunciate each particular word. <laughs> It's scary, you know, and, and, and like you say, if that's part of your brand, if your brand is using AI or teaching people how to use AI, um, sure. But if we're going for something authentic, we've got to have it be real. And there's so many, so many levels to that. Mm -hmm. Like I will get Meryl, I'll get on and do a Facebook live and a, a facial mask sometimes, you know, like I can't wait. I have to tell you this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I'm in and a facial mask. And that's real. That's you. That's it. I exactly. mean, when, when I first started doing being alone on my break, I'm a writer. I yeah. taught myself how to read, was a published author by nine. I am comfortable with the written word. Yep. And then I got into podcasts and I'm like, okay, I can do audio. That's fine. Thank goodness seven years of Toastmasters helped me A, slow down and not talk like a New Yorker who works really, really fast and the hands going all over the place, which still sometimes yeah. happens. But also video is the video. And it took a while to be comfortable 
in front of a camera, which is funny because I used to be a professional photographer and photographers are notoriously about hating being photographed. In fact, I'm launching a podcast next week <laughs> interviewing a headshot photographer and it's just the, yeah, it's most photographers. It's just like, just give me the camera because you can't take a picture of the photographer because he's the one holding the camera in front of his face. So. Isn't that interesting? And, you know, I've seen, I know I went to someone who was uh, purportedly a media specialist website the other day. And guess what? They didn't have a presence on Facebook. And I was just thinking, how in the heck can you do that? That would be well, like me really, saying, yeah. you know, I am so good at business coaching and I make $5,000 a year in my business. Yeah. <laughs> You well, know, is, or not been in my business, right? As I tell my clients, you don't have to be in every single social media. You just have to be where your cl your targeted clients are. Me, yeah. I don't have a business Facebook page. I use Facebook for friends, family, and genealogical research because I'm also a professional genealogist. I live in LinkedIn because I'm pure B two B. So that yeah. that's where my thing is. And the only thing I use Twitter for is hockey because I'm a hockey nerd. So I, I have strict silos where my social media is because I just don't have the time or bandwidth to be on all of it. So it's just like my business is on LinkedIn. And so that's interesting because my business is, I am on LinkedIn, but it's really my personal page that I broadcast. Part of this show goes on my personal mm -hmm. page, um, on my LinkedIn and also on YouTube. Yep. But I really see... Uh, you know, when you have a business page, first of all, somebody has to go visit it, right? And they have to sign up to get notifications. So it's not going to do you any good, really. I mean, the way I see it, it's not going to do you a lot of good. It's a, a, a place that people can go and they can like it. They can go check you out. Um, that sort of thing. You can post there, but really personal, my personal page is integrated just like my, my business is with my lifestyle. Well, exactly. And, because yeah. what you do is a mix of B2B, B2C. You're working one-to-one. Yeah. -one. I'm, I'm working with a lot of like old stodgy corporate folk because that's what I spent 30 years on doing. And that's currently what I'm, my specialty is, translating geek to muggle. So dealing with <laughs> lawyers and cybersecurity guys who are going tech, 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 and I translate it to... <laughs> Hey, bank for trying to flood clothes on your house here. Three things you can do to stop them, you know. Yeah, you help them to put it into something that would actually be persuasive Voice and understandable. Customer. It's I, I keep fighting with my my various and sundry lawyer clients. Well, this is the accurate phrase. Yeah, unfortunately, only lawyers understand what it is. So less accuracy, more understanding. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. And, you know, we really have to. So one of the ways we can avoid being boring is using jargon that we know in our, you know, is is rampant in our own industry. And that's fine. It should mm -hmm. be there if we're at an association meeting with our colleagues. You know, we should take it for granted that people would know that jargon. But the average Joe or the average Joel isn't going to know it. And so immediately we're going to alienate people mm -hmm. by speaking in geek speak or some kind of jargon laden. Oh, absolutely. Um, One of my language. clients is a managed IT company and they're really good at talking to other IT guys because they're all computer guys. And they're, oh, they're okay talking with white collar corporate business they needed a little help. They had no idea how to speak to regular folk because they wanted to start expanding out to retail. So I just created a, a spreadsheet like, okay, these are all the things you like to say. This is how you say it to other tech geeks. This is how to say it in MBA speak. This is how you say it to Uncle Guido's Pizza Shop. And so we're, we're talking like cybersecurity. So the geek speaks all CMMC and HIPAA, blah, 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 blah. And MBA, the, the MBA speak is compliance regulations and, you know, never say anything with three words when you can use 30. And then <laughs> for retail, it's like, we keep hackers out of your computer. So it's, it's breaking it down from, it's all says the same things, but three different ways. Yeah. And it's got to be the outcome for the business owner. They've got to understand the outcome and how that relates to their their return on investment, you know, their bottom line and their mm -hmm. ROI. You know, why would they want to have you come in or mm -hmm. those of you watching, why would they want to have you come in? You've got to be the person who can translate that. 
yep. into normal, ordinary language. You know, Meryl, I was just one of the things I was doing with my Make It Happen Mastermind clients is having them get inside the heads of their clients. And we've been talking about that journey from Island A, where mm -hmm. they were, and they're now on Island B, which is where their prospect or mm -hmm. new client wants to be. And we've got to be able to translate, well, here's where I was. This is how I said it. So the client says, wow, that's me. And then this is where I want to be and say it so that when we express this in our message, people are like, yeah, that you're telling my story. And that's the kind of thing that we know we've done it. Mm -hmm. When somebody says, oh, you're speaking my language or you just got into my head or how did you know? Yep. Then we know that our messaging really is reaching that person authentically. But otherwise, it's just a bunch of drivel. Okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that, that's where you get the engagement by speaking marketing talk, the voice of the customer, yeah. by speaking their language the way they recognize it. It's the kind of tribal, oh, you, you're one of us. You understand our language. You understand our needs. That builds trusts. And if you can explain, it's like, oh, this is the problem you have. This is how we solve that problem. Oh, and again, if you're using it in your own language. I spent 30 years in the STEM field. So I worked with biophysicists and organic chemists and engineers and the like. And so they finally stopped making the PhDs talk to the press because the press would just sit there with the, the deer in the headlights and like, you're doing what with what? And so I would talk with the biophysicists and get a good idea of what the story was. And then I'd go to the press and say, we have cameras that look in, can look inside a living mouse and see the cancer cells as they grow one by one. And we mm. can see in real time on which medicines will shrink those tumors, giving us the ability to send this research to human results. As opposed to using pet spec, CT, and multimodal, it's... I, I always tell people marketing is breadcrumbs. You don't want to info dump everything. You just want to tell them enough to make them go, ooh, tell me more. Exactly. And when we pull out, for example, a reel out of this interview, a short little one minute, max two minute little bit, that will be the goal to provide something really cool, like what you just said, mm -hmm. and not go further with it. So someone wants to click and listen to the whole episode. So really think of it as you are, you know, seducing, really, you're, you're attracting, mm -hmm. maybe not seducing, because that kind of has that feeling of manipulation, but you're mm -hmm. definitely drawing to you, you're definitely attracting to you, the person who you want to serve. And the person you want to serve if you're a scientist is not another scientist in that field. Yeah. So, so people are boring because they don't speak the language of their customer. A number one. Well, they're, they're afraid to as well. They're like, well, this is the language I know. This is what I'm an expert in. So this mm. is what I'm going to talk about. And it's a, the assumption that everyone knows what you know. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of time, there's a lot of miscommunication there. And it's also the feeling, especially when you're in corporate, I need to be professional. Mm -hmm. And so there will be no fun. Everything, here are facts and figures. And again, 30 years in corporate, I had to deal with a lot of that. And luckily I worked for some companies that like, we're professional, but damn it, we're having fun with this job too. And so I quickly realized that when I was between jobs, I would interview companies to see, do I want to work here? So whenever mm -hmm. there was a job interview, they thought they were interviewing me. I was interviewing them. Oh, heck yeah. It's just like, I, I could do this job in my sleep. Do I want to work for you? What's the, what are the people like? What is the management like? Is the management style shut up and do as you're told? We're going to have a problem. Yeah. And, and follow what we've been doing that hasn't worked, which is why we're trying to hire someone, but we don't realize we can't admit that it hasn't worked. <laughs> you know? Oh, my goodness. Well, you made me think about something as you were talking, and that is the ads for the Super Bowl. Now, I want everybody, I want you to think for a second about the Super Bowl ads that are super cool. Mm -hmm. And they always have some element of humor. 
albeit humor, humor or pathos. Right. They make you want to laugh or they make you want to cry. Want to cry. Right. Yeah. But there is some strong emotional, emotional reaction that is created by them. And that probably my favorites really are the ones with the humor. Um, but they want to emotionally move us. And the, the fact of the matter is jargon and industry speak don't emotionally move us. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that people buy not from intellectual speak. They don't buy the specs of something, the features of it. They buy what it can do for them, how it can make their life better, how it can make the lives of the people they care about better, you know, and how it can serve them. That's what they buy. And, and that then they'll be a hero, right? Because yeah. that they, they become the hero. Well, you call yourself chief storyteller. Our customer should be the hero of our messages, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You are not the hero of your own story. Your customers are. Yeah, absolutely. I, I go to a lot of networking groups and, you know, if you're in the same group with the same people, everyone's doing their 30 second pitch. It's just this point we have each other's memorized. So I was finally in another group saying, okay, no more 30 second pitches. What you're pitching is your clients client of the week story. You're not allowed to tell the same story twice, twice. So you can send your name, your company and what you do. The rest of your pitch is this is customer of the week. Case study. And that was much more engaging. And oh, I get it now. Because, you know, especially when people first start networking, they have this fear that they need to tell everyone everything they do. So they give you this kind of bulleted list. Well, I do this mm -hmm. and I do this and I do this and I do this. And by the time they're done, you remember the first thing they said and the last thing they said and everything else in the middle is lost. If you're lucky, right? They may remember yeah. that piece, you know? And I have to say, there is this complete misconception out there. And, you know, this is the bold, badass business owners show. So we bring you the no bullshit version of business, y'all. And that is like, do not start out with your name. Nobody gives a shit. Mm -hmm. Did Yeah, I said that. Nobody gives a shit. They don't want to know your name. Nobody cares that I'm Barnsley Brown. They don't. What they care about is something exciting or interesting or emotionally riveting that I can ask, like, did you realize that Mm -hmm. Only people who get coaching uh, are in the top 3% of wealth owners in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I'm just making that up, you all. But when you hear that, don't you go like, whoa. And it gets your attention. Yeah, my, my, the opening of one of my pitches is your elevator pitch is 30 seconds. What would you say if I gave you 30 minutes? Hmm. And there you have it. Yeah. Man. Right. And, and there are all sorts of things you can do because I've even opened up and this might be how we met. I can't remember, Meryl, where I opened up something. I said, I said, are you boring? Mm -hmm. If so, you're not for my show. <laughs> and then I went on from there. And I have to tell you, like yesterday I was at an in-person event. And I came in a bit late. Uh, I had been working with a client and there was a little subtle, there were three or four of us who came in late. It was a big event. And there was a little subtle shaming going on there, Meryl. <laughs> about people being late, even though we're business owners, we do our best. Mm -hmm. And um, so when it got to me, the other women were like, I'm sorry. Da, 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 da. When it got to me, I said, I'm late because I was just helping a client of mine reach over a hundred thousand dollars in the first five months of her business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm Dr. Barnsley Brown. Yep. And I do this, in my make it happen mastermind. Mm -hmm. And if you would like to have a complimentary session in which we talk about what's holding you back and I give you a tool to get you through it, if you're willing to do the work, then get up with me and we will set your session. Mm -hmm. Get results now. Yep. And I started, I stopped there mm -hmm. and I had so many people come up and say, oh, we just loved your 30 seconds and da, 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 da. But the whole point is I don't do mine. Rarely do I do the same one twice, mm -hmm. Meryl. Why? Because yep. it's bore, it bores me. If it's I'm even bored, more I know you're you bored. Stay, it's even more fun when you're on like a Zoom call. You could see someone reading it from their screen. Hi, I am Dr. So-and-so and I have a thing and it's going to be really world changing for you. It's just like, if you can't remember who you are and what you do, why do you need a script to tell us what you're doing? Do you not remember? <laughs> Yeah. People get nervous. People do get nervous. And yes, I understand public speaking. 
whether it's on Zoom or in person. Toastmasters, Toastmasters, Toastmasters. Yes. I tell everyone I know. And in the business. National Speakers Association, yep. too. Well, the yes. cool thing about Toastmasters, and I was in it for seven years, is it's yep. not all about public speaking, it's about communications. So mm -hmm. they will teach you how to get up and do a speech and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But every meeting starts with something called table topics. Exactly. Which is you pull a, a topic out of a hat and you have 90 seconds, no more than no less, to talk about it. And it is such an important thing to learn. That's why I joined Toastmasters. I've always been a comfortable speaker. My problem is the off button. <laughs> So <laughs> that's was, hilarious, Meryl. Wait, say that again. <laughs> yeah, my, like, my, my problem was the off button. So I needed that 90 seconds. How to tell a story beginning, middle, and end and in ends. 90 seconds. Yes. Yes. And even how to tell a story in two sentences, which yep. is really what we can do. Like you're pointing out when we do our 30 seconds, mm -hmm. instead of saying what you do, just say, you know, I'm just this just in. I'm so excited. I my client so and so just hit. One hundred and fifty-seven thousand mm -hmm. dollars profit in her first X number of days in the program. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, th I'm Dr. Barnsley Brown. That's what I do. But we use use the case study, use props, use mm -hmm. your cell phone. Plus, I have a really cool picture of it, that Klimt kiss. Yep. Yeah, which I have actually right in front of me too. I do love mm -hmm. that picture. Um, use props. Yeah. Use no. props. Well, like you were saying, laughter. One of my clients is a insurance guy. Fastest way to watch people panic is to walk into a room and say, hi, I sell insurance. Yes. And so his when it's his turn to talk, it's like, hi, I sell parachutes. And people look at him like, really? Like, yeah, because, you know, parachutes like insurance are only useful if you have it when you need it. And people will laugh. And you were talking about the importance of laughter. A strong emotion, laughter, sadness, even anger will trigger dopamine and dopamine yeah. attaches to memory. So I people love that. We re will remember you longer if you trigger an emotion with your message. If your message is just straight facts and whatnot, it's gonna, literally going to in one ear, out the other. Yeah. And, no, and people are not going to buy from you from that. I yeah. mean, there's no way. They're not. I'm just saying, you know, and that's why we got to be real. You know, I remember um, I've gone on and I've talked about some really difficult stuff in some Facebook lives and I did it to serve other people because so often folks look at us and they look at the outside and think, oh, well, so-and-so has it all together and they're so professional. I love that word you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, so professional. But the truth of the matter is, you know, I got some struggles. So do you. Mm -hmm. And when we're real about those, actually, we give people it's like Velcro, you know, yeah. it's like this Velcro relational Velcro. And then that person can say, well, gosh, I get it. I grew up in an alcoholic home. Oh, I feel connected to her or, oh, I get it. I'm divorced. I feel connected mm -hmm. or I'm a, I'm taking care of my mom. I feel connected um, to that person. So we've got to be willing, though. Mm -hmm to do as Brene Brown and so many people talk about these days to be vulnerable. But even more than that, I would just say to be really open about our experiences, yeah, the stories in our lives. You're a human being trying to sell to other human beings. Again, you, you were saying they, people do not buy on facts and bullet points and whatnot. They will say, Oh, I did the research and my research. Yeah. It's still all sales is emotional. It's and the, they may I be analytical problem. and they may do that, right? Oh, but they, the they may emotion... say that, but it's still the decision okay. will be made mm -hmm. emotionally. That has been proven time and time again. There's a, a number of TED Talks out mm -hmm. there on communications, and they're actually showing people under PET spec CTs and the like. And this is the part of the brain that yep. goes up that shows emotion. This is analytics. I've decided to buy this product. Bing, it's an emotional thing. Because there's that dopamine hit. I'm exactly. having a problem. This is, this is going to solve my problem. And if you're B2B, a company's having a problem by bringing on this project, by bringing on this service, this is going to make me look good in front of my bosses. This is going to pay for itself in X number of years. This is going to make the company run smoother. Everyone's going to look at me and say, hey, wow. There was that always joke that no one got fired by buying IBM. Because, again, it was that emotional thing. It's the, but what if you make a mistake and buy the wrong thing? It's just like, everyone will hate you. You'll get fired. You'll end up sleeping in a box. 
and people take that in and you know and i noticed something about your language too which is very powerful and it's something i talk to my clients about is you use pictures you use word pictures so it's going to be something like you'll be living in a box that's an image and we can all see it you know you'll be under a um a bridge living in a cardboard box that somebody ditched at the recycle bin mm -hmm. you know and it brings up an image that evokes an emotional response and uh so i would say to everybody you know another way we cannot be boring in addition to what you've shared about not using jargon not using the industry speak and also uh being willing to share your stories and share the stories of your clients mm -hmm. i would say to everybody it's also about the language you use make it images think yes. about make, make you it know, or metaphors or similes yeah metaphor simile make it a story I can say, well, one of my clients got $4.5 million over the past four years from the single podcast. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Or I can say, one of my clients wanted to do a podcast to a very specific audience, lawyers in New York State. Because there's this big, scary cyber law that if you're a lawyer and you get hacked and New York State can prove that you didn't do everything possible to protect your client's data, mm -hmm. They're going after you personally, not the firm. They're going after you. You. And that's what that podcast was about. It was the, are you a lawyer in New York State? This is all the horrible things you need to know if you don't know about this law. <laughs> Call this me if you need yeah. help. And literally 24 hours after we produced that thing, he got his first call. Cautionary tale. It was a cautionary tale, yep. you know? Think about it. Urban legends, y'all. Urban legends. We've all heard the legends, you know, yeah. where the lipstick, the killer, and then he writes the lipstick on the mirror yeah. after he kills the, the mm -hmm. girls that go, who have just gone off to college and took boys back to their room. You know, cautionary tales are powerful. Anything that warns somebody about what can happen and evokes fear mm -hmm. and panic is powerful. If we think about it, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, F-A-W-N, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. faint. Some people say yep. faint. Some people say fawn. Mm -hmm. These are the guttural responses we can have to mm -hmm. a stimuli that come from our amygdala, our reptilian brain. Yep. Fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Think about it. And which of those are you evoking? Right. And which ones are you evoking on purpose? Yes. And which ones are you looking at? Like I said, someone walks in the room, I sell insurance. That's a big epinephrine kick. It's just like, oh, he's selling insurance. He wants my money. You know what else? Who wants my money? Muggers. Oh my God, I'm being mugged. <laughs> and that's yeah. how so many people deal with sales pitches. It pretty much comes across as I have a product or service. You have money. I give me your money. Yeah. As opposed to you don't want to trigger the epinephrine. You want to trigger the dopamine. You want to trigger that, oh, you're in my tribe. You understand me. You understand yep. my problem. You may have a, a way to solve that problem. And yeah, it's all neurochemistry on yeah. there. And yeah, it's, and like as a coach, most of your stories is the hero's journey. This is where well, I was. This is how I started. These are the troubles I got into. This is how a mentor helped yes. me. And this is where I am now back at the beginning, ready to help you on your cycle. So I can help guide you around the landmines that tripped me over. It's the, you're the Gandalf. You're the Obi-Wan. You're the one. Yeah. I have been there. Let me take your hand and guide you through so you don't make the same mistakes I did. And then there's one other part I say to that basic idea, and that is, I wish I'd had me as yes. I am now at the beginning of my business. Yes. And my whole joy is helping women get to it. It took me over 10 years. It was maybe 13 and a half years, 13, 14 years, 13 about to get to six figures and then to move way beyond that. But it took that amount of time. Now, I built slowly and steadily. There are so many things I did well, but there's so many things I fucked up. And I just want people to be able to learn from my F ups yep. and not have to do it the long, hard, struggling way mm -hmm. in their business. Oh, absolutely. Know? And that's one reason I like networking. Everyone's like, oh, I'm networking for leads. I'm like, yeah, the leads will come. I yeah. want to talk to people doing things that I'm not doing, that may be doing something different. Oh, you're in finance. Well, what about this? Well, oh, you're a programmer. What do you know about that? 
And it's finding other ideas from different industries in different markets that adopt, adapt, evolve, and constantly trying to find new ways to make what I'm doing easier, better. Sometimes you may come up to me like, oh, I do it this way. It's just like, oh, okay, that's completely different from the way I do it, but I can see how that works for you. Other times, like, I do it this way. It's like, oh, sweetie, no, I can show you how to do that in half the time. And sometimes I do it this way. I'm like, ooh, oh, really? Ooh, teach me. That that, that sounds yeah. really cool. So it's it's that ability to constantly keep an open mind and, and learn and absorb and see what works. And, oh, let me try this. Eh, I think I'll go back to the old way. Or let me try that. And, oh, this is so much easier. So it's it's that ability to keep an open mind and try to learn from everyone because every single human being on this planet knows at least one thing you don't. Absolutely. And I always like to say every, every voice matters and we can find wisdom and we can find ideas like you, you point out from other industries. We can find them from the homeless guy, right? I'll mm -hmm. tell you what, I was riding along. I come along. I see this dude with a cardboard sign and Meryl, I get closer and I'm like, OMG, his cardboard sign is bilingual. He's got it in English and Spanish. That is freaking awesome. That is genius. Mm -hmm. Genius. Because yeah. we have more in North Carolina, we have more immigrants eat from different uh, Latino um, cultures even than California. Oh, you got a whole bunch of Northerners yeah. down there. I'm told. Oh, we got them too. Yeah. I'm told that carry is containment area for resident Yankees. So. so he needed to put something about soda pop, right? On yep. his, on his cardboard. But when I saw that, I thought, isn't this just the perfect example? Because I like to talk about how people are leaving money on the table if they don't have someone who can translate for them, depending on your industry, but right. translate into Spanish and just to look at Bank of America and all the big banks, and you'll see everything's already in English and Spanish. But here's the dude on the corner, and he's got his cardboard sign in English and Spanish. I just, you know what? I should have given him money just for that. Yep. Just for that. Because it was like, what the heck? How smart is know that? Know your marketing, know your audience, he know knew the it. language. Man, yep. and he was not wasting his time out in the hot sun. <laughs> so I want y'all to think about what Meryl has shared so far. You know, I'm sure you're seeing some things that you've been doing that haven't really been effective, like starting out with your name or talking in your industry speak or not using vivid language or not telling a, a particular interesting story about your clients mm -hmm. and not I mean, letting your, your humanity boring? shine through. Yeah, are your clients boring? I mean, yeah, I guess if you're a tax accountant and you're just dealing with other tax accountants, yeah, it, it's not a lot of life of the party. But yeah, everyone is just so different. They have such interesting backstories and the like. And that's what makes us human. We are fascinated to learn about each other. And if you're an accountant or you do something sort of dry, you better spice it up even more. So I have a client who just graduated from the Make It Happen Mastermind mm -hmm. and has generated over 350K of profit in her first year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hello. Um, and what's wonderful is, you know, she's an accountant, started mm -hmm. her own practice. And I said to her, and she has a good sense of humor. And I said, it's time to use that. It's mm -hmm. time to use it. So for example, she did this, um, she said, I'm going to do this, this evening event for the chamber, mm -hmm. um, a meet and greet. And I want to give it a theme. And I said, well, why, why don't you do something like a Hawaiian Lua since it's summer? And we came up with the Aloha, your taxes. Aloha, your taxes, right? Mm -hmm. And it's so corny, but people loved it. And mm -hmm. a whole theme around that. And I also, another time, for example, I told her, look, I want you to get some little toilets. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you can find them on Amazon. You can find everything, just little tiny toilets. Mm -hmm. And I don't want you to say what they're for, but put them all around on all the tables at the next big event you go to. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes your time, I want you to get up and talk about how they're flushing their money down the toilet mm -hmm. and that you save the average business X amount on you help them hold on to X amount of their hard earned profit. Mm -hmm. And she did that. And people of course adored it. She ended up being one of three uh, businesses that were recognized the top as the top three growing businesses in her region. Yep. And, you know, it was that creativity that made her stand out. Yeah. And, you know, do do something different. Don't be afraid to be different. And the worst thing that can happen is people won't laugh. And 
when I when I I uh, have that happen, and it does happen. By the way, mm -hmm. it does happen sometimes, and people don't laugh. It's something that's supposed to be funny. I'll just say it's okay to laugh. Cough it up. It's just mm. a hairball. Mm. <laughs> And yeah. then people laugh at that, right? And and don't be afraid to fail. That's the only way you're going to grow. If if I could tell my 22 year old self anything, it's the don't be afraid to fail because it's going to happen anyway. So don't freak out about it. And it's okay to make mistakes. Just learn from them and don't make the same ones over and over again. And if you are. Hire a coach to work you through what keeps tripping you up. And I wouldn't even say, and if you are, the fact of the matter is it, a blind spot is a blind spot. Yep. There's a reason they call it a blind spot. You don't know mm -hmm. it's there. And yep. this is why I have six coaches myself because, oh, yeah. you know, I would never dare run my business without other people who I can ask for feedback mm -hmm. and ask for advice and ask for resources and ways to do things that work, that actually work and are proven. So I just want to say to everybody, you know, it, that a lot of people think having a coach is really um, optional. And in the same way, they think having a financial advisor may be optional or having a tax person may be optional. These Electricity is optional. Yeah, optional, y'all. That, that shit ain't optional. Yeah. Well, please. Yeah. When I first started my, my own agency, I was in corporate for 30 years. So I gave myself two years to figure out how to start be my own boss and start my own company. I surrounded myself with mentors and coaches. Yes. Because, okay. I know marketing. What's a PL? Uh, do I have to pay taxes? Uh, how, how do I sell things? And networking? I don't want to talk to strangers. I'm shy. And it, it was two mm. years before I put up the shingle, so to speak, because I needed to learn how not to be a freelancer, not to have a hobby, how to run a business. And you can't do it alone. No. And, and it's not good to try to do it piecemeal, mm -hmm. you know? And I don't care how much you may say or think I don't have money to invest in my business. I like to say to my clients, look, if I said, Meryl, give me, I want you to give me $20 and I'm going to give you back a hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Would you do it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the same thing with coaching. Yep. You invest in your coach mm -hmm. and your business grows exponentially. Um, so you invest a certain amount. Mm -hmm. And you do the work and you have you pick a good person, then that's that's going to come back to you multiplied for sure. Whatever it is you invested. Yeah. Um, so it's a no brainer. Cost but, of doing um, business. Absolutely. The cost of doing business. And I had this discussion with somebody. It was really interesting. They said, you know, really to have a hundred thousand dollar business, you're going to be investing at least 20K. And I said, yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Mm -hmm. And probably way more than that. Um, it depends on how much you want to grow and how fast and with how much pain. Mm -hmm. If you like pain, if you are a business masochist, <laughs> then go it alone. Just go it alone. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you want to, you know, mess up when you do a podcast or introduce yourself, go it alone. Don't listen to what Meryl was talking about here mm -hmm. about being boring. <laughs> and, uh, you know, most people are not going to tell you you're boring. Mm -hmm. They're yep. just not going to do it. Oh yeah. I mean, boring people have their place. That's always good for like falling asleep to listen to someone read their slides <laughs> in a monotone. <laughs> I'm so glad you've mentioned slides several times because I really hate slides and I've always said PowerPoint sucks. Um, you know, and I'm a handout girl. I like mm -hmm. to give people handouts or companion packets where they're writing stuff down and they have ex assessments mm -hmm. to do, et cetera, because otherwise it absolves people of doing any note taking of, oh, you know, absolutely. interacting with the, you, the if pen. You, the, if you watch a TED talk, I think yeah. they allowed maximum three slides with like maybe one or two words on it. It's yeah. a picture. It's a whatnot. Everything else is the human voice and talking. So I do a lot of uh, presentations for SCORE. This is my way mm. of saying thank you. And they're like, oh, well, we'd like to sell, send your PowerPoint to the attendees. I'm like, no, because it's like a couple of words per slide. It's not going to make any sense without the context. You're recording this thing. Send them the video. That's exactly. fine. But like, here's a slide with a, a kid th throwing a baseball. <laughs> well, unless you realize that's where that's where I'm talking about sales pitches, you're not going to have an idea what the hell this thing is about. 
and that means you actually have good slides because the slides should be a another visual rendering mm -hmm. of what the story is that you're telling. Yep. You know, they should be an accessory. They should not be your focal point. And so many times people just get up and read their slides. And, How boring is that? And the thing is, the minute you put words on a slide, people stop listening to you and start reading. Yeah. Yeah. So even if you have slides on there, do it like, okay, here's one word. I'm going to talk about this, blah, blah, blah. Click. Here's the next word. I'm going to yep. talk about this. Don't put all the words up there because, again, you're going to lose them for the duration of them reading. And the other thing is if you're on Zoom, think about it. When you share those slides, mm -hmm. then you have this tiny gallery over here. If you put it on gallery, you just yep. get going to see a few faces. That's it. You really cannot engage people. People turn off their cameras. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they go have a glass of water, go to the restroom. They go, you know, I clean was, out the litter box. I am dying. I was on a Zoom call and someone was doing their 10 minute presentation. Let me read my slides one by one. And I'm glancing at the the other Zoom people. And yeah, you had some people, you know, doing, da, 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 da. but one had their glasses on and you can see the solitaire cards reflected in her glasses. <laughs> And oh, it's just like, you funny. are not engaging your audience. Yeah. And stop, you know, mm -hmm. just stop. I don't even like, that's another reason on Zoom I really don't like to do it because I want to see everyone just as in a classroom or in a uh, um, event. I want to be able to see people and to be able to gauge an excellent speaker is able to gauge where the energy is. And you can feel when people have something to say mm -hmm. and you're going to direct the energy over to them. That's what yep. you're there to do is facilitate the circulation of energy. And it's not just this. Yep. And Great. that's that's Good. what a lot of Zoom presentations are. It's just like, okay, I am talking to my own reflection. Okay, I'm hoping people are listening. Is it's like, and then questions at the end, and then it was like, oh, okay, everyone was engaged, or nope, no questions. I'm like, did I kill them? Did they all just like kill over and die? Yeah. Did like they just pretend to come and then you know go out and play with the cat while I just talk to myself for an hour? <laughs> I know it's funny sometimes that, you know, it, you won't get many questions. I've had that happen. And then I've had times where I had a lot of questions. And I think, again, a lot of people are very reticent. It's that fear thing, again, that they'll ask a question and somehow it's dumb or oh, it's God, not. That's the stupidest whatever. question Just I ever heard. You all. Yeah, nobody's going to ever say, oh, that's a dumb question. You know, what a stupid question you just asked. We're going to, you know, and if you, I don't know. So I've had that. And then I kind of wonder there are a couple of things that go through my head. Meryl is one is like, was everybody just asleep or multitasking? Mm -hmm. That's number one. And number two is, was it a crappy presentation or did I do such a great job that really I covered the topic and they don't yeah. have questions. Yeah. So and there it's, a lot of it's never number three. It's, it's never number three. It's like, Oh, I answered. We're human <laughs> beings. We're always. Yeah. And yeah, sometimes you get what you just like the last question. Like I didn't have, talk about that at all during the meeting but uh okay i can answer that question anyway so it's, right when, and, when and i that's used to okay. when i was facilitating other meetings i always had like test questions because like any questions some people need to think about it or whatnot so i'm like okay we have oh we've got three questions so far so i would make up like the first three questions just to get things going and give people time to come up with their own questions and yes, I'd make one kind of like simple and whatnot. So people like, oh, OK, so somebody else was a little confused about this part. And so it was just kind of oil to make people like, oh, I don't want to be the first person to ask a question. Nice. That's a great technique. Did everybody so hear that? If, if, if you have like some teaser questions out there. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I, like, I don't want to be the, the first, meeting, but I'll be the someone fourth. Asked so. me this. Yeah. Exactly. Just kind of get it rolling. And you can even say to people, you know, who are coming, hey, be sure to ask a good question, would you? Yep. And and just, you know, let people just kind of charge them with that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if they don't ask you a question, just have a good question to ask them and ask mm -hmm. everybody to weigh in on in on the chat, you know, such or as well, what's your aha moment today? Yeah, the last time I did this, someone asked about that. And I always thought that was a really interesting. Anyone else was curious about that kind of particular topic? Because that, that, and and I, what I try to do is the I'm planning to do this talk again in another chapter of SCORE. 
what did I miss? What, what, what were mm. their gaps? What didn't I cover that you were hoping I was covered? Was nice. anything I covered too fast? Was there anything? Did I just info dump on you and let you going? Eh? And so if you, if they get to feel part of the process, as opposed to, uh, this isn't a lecture. This is the beginning of a conversation. I'll start. I need you guys to come in. That's excellent. And that will make you ever so unboring. Yes. When you engage people, mm -hmm. when you engage them emotionally, but you also engage them by asking them questions, asking them to weigh in in the chat. You can even put a poll, you know, have them put a why or a no, just ask a simple question or mm -hmm. what's your big aha today or what's your takeaway or um, have you ever had an issue like X mm -hmm. and share it in the chat? Then it creates this polyphony of voices and it's mm -hmm. no longer this monologue where you're kind of spewing out yes. one way to someone, which is ever so boring. It is and very boring. No one gets excited about, about lectures mm -mm. unless the, whoever's doing it is a great storyteller. I mean, there are some great TED Talks on there on topics for the most part, I couldn't care less about, but the speaker is so engaging and interesting that my mom's like, what are you watching? Oh, it's this neurochemistry talk. And it's just <laughs> like, but he's really funny, really interesting. And I want to know more. Yeah. And it, it's not the topic. Mm -hmm. You all, I want you to hear that. It's not the topic that's boring. Mm -hmm. You can make any topping uh, any topping, any top, topic yeah. interesting. The reason I thought topping is my head was going ahead. And I was thinking about a math professor I used to teach with mm -hmm. a friend of mine at Wake Forest. This is a long time ago. And he would do math, but he would use pizzas. Mm -hmm. And it was so cool. And his students loved him. And he was interesting. And he knew how to teach and tell stories. And, you know, the if I'd had a math teacher like that, I might yeah. have actually enjoyed math. And you remember what you learn. Again, if you're engaged, you got the dopamine going, it's triggering an emotion, you're laughing, you're interesting, you're engaged, you'll remember longer. And if Is you that... give people something to apply, you give them some kind of assignment, doesn't have yep. to be huge, but mm -hmm. something to apply. I want you to, um, to try this new 30 second mm -hmm. process I just taught you tomorrow at your, net, your networking yep. event, or I want you to go do a quick video, one minute video on Facebook about what you learned in our Facebook group, whatever, just something to have people apply the information so that it's experiential learning, yes. which sticks with us so much better than any kind of spoon feeding, you know, or spewing. I love the word spewing. Meryl, you have given us so much here about how not to be so boring. <laughs> and and it's been fun. The time has gone so quickly. And I, I know that you have another appointment that you've got to keep, but I really appreciate you coming. And I wanted to ask you, would you like to give away something to everybody? Something Nita, what would you like to give away? I give away my ebook, How to Overcome Overwhelm in Seven Easy Steps. It's on my website, you all, spirited-solutions.com. Make sure mm -hmm. you put the dash, not underscore, and you'll get it. And it's filled with strategies. And it's also fun and funny and has stories in it, too, so you won't be bored. Very cool. Uh, what would you like to gift them or what would you like to give them as an action step? Well, Primarily, one of the things I always offer is a half an hour free brainstorming. If wow. you have a question about marketing, if you have a question about how do I stand out? I'm a real estate agent. There are 450 million real estate agents. How do I stand out? Or I'm doing something really, really interesting, but no one understands what I'm doing. Don't you just love going to one of those networking things and someone's 30 seconds pitch is last five minutes and you still have no idea what the hell they do? Yeah. I love helping those people. <laughs> so sad. And, you know, I know actually somebody turned to me at a thing recently and said, you know what I like about what you always say? I always know exactly what you do, mm -hmm. <laughs> which means most people you don't know. What the heck is that person do? I don't mm -hmm. get it. Well, it's been so helpful. So Meryl, where do they go to get this? What is your website or where do you want them to go? My website is www.smith.com. Douglas, D-O-U-G-L-A-S-S, 
smithdouglas.com for Smith Douglas Associates. You can learn a, bit, a little bit more about me. I do B2B marketing communications consulting. I also do personal branding and I'm a commercial podcast producer. So if you have any interest in, in branding, marketing or podcasting, I also have my calendar link right on my website. You can hook up for uh, 30 minutes and I'd love to chat. And so it's www.smithdouglas with two S's.com. Yep. That's it. Okay. I, I wanted to make sure that it was that not Smith Douglas Associates. So it's www.smithdouglas.com. Two S's.com. And they, everybody listening, you can go and you can grab that complimentary 30 minute session, which I know is extremely valuable. Do you put a value on that? I'm sure it is at least 300 to $400, right? It's about that. Yep. At least. Yes. Yeah, so you all go get that and tell tell Meryl when you connect that you came from bold, badass business owners. And before I forget, I'm also going to put in a totally shameless plug, totally shameless because I don't believe in shame. Mm -hmm. Shame kills. And guess what? Go subscribe to my YouTube channel, y'all, because I don't want you to miss any of the incredible guests who are coming on every Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern on to bold, badass business owners to bring you the no BS approach to business so you can have the success and the growth that you want and not have to struggle and, you know, fall flat on your face as many times as I have, and probably you have, Meryl. Oh, you know, absolutely. we want to stop that banana peel thing happening, right? Mm -hmm. No more business banana peels. Just learn from ours and jump over the banana peel. You'll be able to soar. And by the way, you're already a bold, badass business owner if you're tuning in and you're subscribing. That for sure, I know. Mm -hmm. So thank you again, Meryl. We really appreciate you. And everyone, I'll see you next Friday.